On February 1st, 2004, millions across America tuned in to watch two of MTV's biggest stars perform at a Super Bowl halftime show produced by MTV itself. Janet Jackson had wowed the music video world with her 1989 visual album, Rhythm Nation 1814, and gone on to dominate MTV throughout the 90s with a series of high-budget videos that highlighted her unique dance style and undeniable sex appeal. On the other side of things was Justin Timberlake, the newly crowned Prince of Pop. Timberlake was all over MTV during the late 90s boy band craze as a member of NSYNC. In 2002, he launched into a solo career with the celebrated album Justified. The second single from that album was Cry Me a River, a song about Timberlake's public breakup with Britney Spears. That video depicted Timberlake breaking into the house of a Spears lookalike and filming himself having sex. It was a step away from Timberlake's clean-cut boy band reputation and toward a darker, more sexual edge. Timberlake had been a fan of Jackson's growing up, attending the Rhythm Nation tour as a child, and later opening for Jackson as a member of NSYNC during her Velvet Rope World Tour. In that way, his collaboration with her at the Super Bowl was poised to be a celebration of sorts, a passing of the torch from one member of pop royalty to another. And the performance did prove to be one of the most important moments in pop music history, but not for the reasons that Jackson or Timberlake might have expected. Toward the end of Timberlake's performance of Rock Your Body, right after singing the line, gonna have you naked by the end of this song, Timberlake pulled away a piece of Janet Jackson's top. The plan was for the garment to come off and reveal a red lace bra, but a wardrobe malfunction meant that the bra tore away as well, leaving Jackson's breast exposed for a fraction of a second. The fallout from this was enormous. A media firestorm rose up around the incident. Jackson responded by pointing out that there were much more important issues going on in the world and that this was not the big story everyone was making it out to be. The music industry felt that this response was insufficient and decided to blacklist Jackson for having the audacity to exist as a woman with a breast. This incident created ripples that changed the entire music industry in the years to come. There was one particular piece of fallout from the event that would transform the music video industry specifically, but it went almost entirely unnoticed at the time. A computer engineer named Jod Kareem had missed the halftime show, but wanted to see what the fuss was all about. He turned to the internet to try to find video of the incident and couldn't find it anywhere. Kareem realized that there was a real gap in the online video world, so he reached out to his friends Steve Chen and Chad Hurley to work on a project to fill that. That project took the better part of a year for them to put together, but on February 14th, 2005, they went live with a site that would let people upload their own video content. That site was called YouTube. It would take a little while for YouTube to catch on in the mainstream, but once it did, the music industry and music videos would never be the same again. Welcome to Hit Record. YouTube might have been the most drastic change to come out of digital technology, but computers were already transforming music videos by the late 90s. One of the biggest shifts came in animation. Computer-generated animation had progressed in leaps and bounds from the clunky days of Dire Straits' Money for Nothing. Animators could now create vivid, if a bit uncanny, worlds to represent music visually. Directors Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris turned the Red Hot Chili Peppers into video game characters for Californication. Eiffel 65 told a wild sci-fi story complete with blue CGI aliens for their Blue Dabba Dee. Radiohead's Pyramid Song matched eerie atmospheric music to surreal underwater scenery created with CGI. And some people sought to push things even further. In 2003, Eric Wernquist created a short 3D animated video set to a viral sound created by a teenage student named Daniel Malmedal. Wernquist posted that animation, which he dubbed The Annoying Thing, on a forum called CG Talk and on his own website, and it quickly spread across the internet. A ringtone company saw the potential in the character, bought it off Wernquist, and created a music video for The Annoying Thing, calling it Crazy Frog. That video went even more viral, and soon the company that made it was trying to milk the character for all it was worth. Crazy Frog soon inspired imitators like Gummy Bear and Holly Dolly. These were all new takes on an old idea, the virtual musician. 
Some of the earliest versions of this existed all the way back in the 60s with groups like the Monkees or the Archies, and the Buggles predicted the concept in their landmark Video Killed the Radio Star. But digital technology allowed people to push this idea further than ever. The greatest example of the virtual band concept was born in 1998, when musician Damon Albarn and visual artist Jamie Hewlett collaborated to create Gorillaz. The duo came up with the idea for Gorillaz while living together as flatmates. Hewlett remembered in an interview with Wired. One day we were home watching MTV with our eyes just kind of glazed. Because if you watch MTV too long, it's a bit like hell. There's nothing of substance there. So we got this idea for a cartoon band, something that would be a comment on that. They built this idea out and developed a cast of archetypal characters that would satirize the music industry as they saw it. These characters made their music video debut in Tomorrow Comes Today, whose title stands as a bold proclamation of the era they were bringing along. The video featured relatively low production value, composing simple animations onto stock footage backgrounds, but it was enough to prove that the concept had legs. A year later, Gorillaz would follow up with their breakthrough hit, Clint Eastwood. The video for Clint Eastwood was a clear step up from Tomorrow Comes Today. It had a four month production period, and it used that time to create one of the most memorable videos of its era. That video is a blueprint for what Gorillaz videos would become, expanding the mythos of the characters and looping in a feature with Del the Funky Homo Sapien playing Del the Ghost Rapper, a ghost that possesses the drummer Russell. Finally, someone let me out of my cage. Now, time for me is nothing because I'm counting no eggs. Now, I couldn't be there. Now, you shouldn't be scared. I'm good at repairs and I'm under each snare. They would follow this up in short succession with 192000, and before long, these virtual stars found themselves as genuine hit makers. In 2005, they released their incendiary sophomore album, Demon Days, an instant classic that captured the spirit of the era both visually and conceptually. The success of Gorillaz is directly tied to their inventive use of the music video as medium, and to an inherent understanding of a new, emerging generation of kids. In 2001, Virgin Records co-president Ray Cooper told the Chicago Tribune about what he saw in this new generation, who had grown up in a time where MTV was no longer novel. He noted that they watched Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon as much as MTV, adding that animation was allowing people to experiment in ways that the live-action music video hadn't. I think there's a growing sense within that community that it can be very hard to truly make an original live-action video. In 2003, Daft Punk would make a significant addition to the animated music video canon with Interstellar 5555, an anime feature film that served as a companion piece for their 2001 album Discovery. That film was inspired by the work of legendary manga writer Leiji Matsumoto, and Matsumoto actually helped supervise its creation. It saw Daft Punk weave an intergalactic sci-fi storyline through videos for hit songs like One More Time and Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. A few years before Daft Punk collaborated with Matsumoto, another high-profile comic artist had collaborated with musicians. 1998 saw the new metal band Korn team up with Spawn creator Todd McFarlane to create Freak on a Leash. Sometimes I cannot take this place. Sometimes it's my life I can't taste. Sometimes I cannot feel my face. You'll never see me fall from grace. Freak on a Leash was an enormous success, hitting number one on MTV's Total Request Live and spending 10 non consecutive days there while it fought off Britney Spears' Baby One More Time and NSYNC's A Little More Time on You. Corn videos were so popular that Total Request Live actually had to retire them because too many people were calling in requests. New Metal was a rising force in the new millennium and one that came with a distinct visual aesthetic. Ever since the birth of the music video, metal in its many iterations had thrived on the visual language of the media. New metal in particular built on the dark imagery from the 90s industrial movement, punctuating its grimy visuals with distinctive political messages. Many in the movement embraced the horror aesthetics at the time. Static X used creepy claymation paired with deep greens and blues for their push it. 
Deftones created an eerie tale with drab palettes and ominous scenes of a Halloween party in Change in the House of Flies. Slipknot built entire personalities around twisted masks that call to mind slasher antagonists. New Metal peaked in mainstream popularity in 2003 when Linkin Park released their sophomore album Meteora. Linkin Park spoke for a generation struggling with the onset of this strange new era. They used sharp videos to underline the messages of their songs. Numb tells a story of teenage alienation and mental health with its teenage protagonist using art as an outlet in a parallel to Chester Bennington's own struggles with mental illness. The band won Best Rock Video at the 2003 VMAs for the striking set design and surreal imagery of Somewhere I Belong. The most ambitious video for Meteora was the last one released, Breaking the Habit. That video was a collaboration with Japanese animator Kazuto Nakazawa. It told a tense human story on the backdrop of a dark, dystopian city. This vision was one of the most distinctive of the era, and no doubt influenced a rising culture of AMVs, fan-made music videos created by editing other pieces of media together. As they were riding the wave of Meteora, Linkin Park produced one of the most successful crossover projects in music history by collaborating with Jay-Z, one of the biggest names in hip-hop by the early 2000s. Jay-Z had been a staple in hip-hop since the 90s, but in the 2000s, he was proving to have a longevity that few of his hip-hop peers could compare to. And indeed, it was in 2003 that he released maybe the most iconic video of his career, 99 Problems. Jay-Z originally wanted Quentin Tarantino to direct the video, but producer Rick Rubin talked him into working with Mark Romanek. By this point, Romanek had been working in music videos for over a decade and had made some of the most celebrated videos of all time. Jay-Z was supposedly going to retire after the Black Album, with the video being a swan song for his career. To lean into that, Romanek made a video that embraced Jay-Z's history, shooting the projects he grew up in with unmatched style and flair. The video, like the song itself, uses this imagery to comment on systemic racism in the US, and ends with the murder of Jay-Z. This violent end went against MTV's oblique censorship rules, but the station made an exception for Jay-Z. Whenever the video showed, it was preceded by a clip of MTV special correspondent John Norris explaining that the murder was purely symbolic. MTV has, for more than a decade now, discouraged videos containing any kind of gun imagery or gratuitous violence. On very rare occasions, however, when compelled by the artistic merits of a particular clip, MTV has offered at least some form of limited airplay to just a handful of controversial videos. Well, now Jay-Z can be added to the list of artists pushing the channel's envelope. Fresh from the edit suite comes 99 Problems. The video, said to be Jay's last, culminates with a scene in which the MC is violently gunned down on the streets of his beloved Brooklyn. Jay insists that the dramatic conclusion to his music video career is not gratuitous, but rather, as he recently told our very own Sway, rife with symbolism, showing the death of Jay-Z and the rebirth of Sean Carter. Right now, you can check it out for yourself. Here is 99 Problems from Jay-Z. If you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I, I got, got 99, 99 problems, problems, but a bitch ain't one. I got the rap patrol on the cat patrol. Foes that want to make sure my cat... 99 Problems was a standout video that sat apart from many of its rap contemporaries. By the early 2000s, hip-hop had entered one of the most controversial periods in its history, the bling era. The bling era saw rap fully embrace indulgence and opulence. Rap videos became dominated by expensive cars, ostentatious jewelry, and any other display of wealth and success that directors could think of. Bling was a victory lap for hip hop, which had risen from the underground and defied systemic racism to take over the music industry. But Bling was also a movement full of predatory producers and heavy misogyny. These realities drew plenty of criticism at the time, but at the end of the day, what really killed the era was that people were starting to get bored. Some artists like Outkast and Missy Elliott continued to push boundaries, but by and large, hip hop videos in the early 2000s were starting to feel bland and predictable. And a similar problem was happening in pop. There were, of course, standouts. Britney Spears released a dozen or so iconic videos through the late 90s and early 2000s, but there might be none as perfectly assembled as 2003's Toxic. While many pop artists had limited say over their videos, Spears developed the entire idea for Toxic on her own before bringing it to director Joseph Kahn. Kahn was one of the most prolific music video directors of all time, rising up in the late 90s by collaborating with everyone from 
Rob Zombie to Backstreet Boys to Faith Hill. His first collaboration with Britney came in 2000's Stronger. That video, like so much of Spears' catalog, was built on the back of her distinctive choreography and undeniable style. Toxic dialed both of these up another notch. Spears had an idea for a video that would feature her as a secret agent out for revenge. This agent disguises herself as a sultry stewardess before jumping into an action set piece, dodging lasers and running away from explosions. She worked closely with choreographer Brian Friedman to ensure that each cut and each scene flowed seamlessly together through dance. Khan told MTV, Directors and choreographers typically have to work together, but this video was strictly structured by the way in which she dances in each scene. It's usually more random than that. This planning means that the cut from Britney on the plane to nude Britney covered in diamonds doesn't feel jarring at all. That diamond shot, the most scandalous of the video, actually featured Spears nude with no bodysuit. Spears made everybody on the set leave for that section of the shoot, so it was just her and Khan alone with the camera. Khan later joked about the moment with MTV, calling the job one of the best in the world. The entire video showed that Spears was not just a brilliant performer, but someone who understood the way that she was perceived by the public and the media, and someone who could use that to assert her place within the broader cultural canon. The video is clearly inspired by Marilyn Monroe and Madonna, but also features influence from John Woo movies, James Bond, and Blade Runner, and it manages to balance it all out with a cheeky sort of comedy. Khan told MTV about what made Britney such a singular artist. She totally understands that she's naughty and nice, that she's the girl next door gone bad who is constantly titillating you. Spears would further assert herself through sexuality as her career continued. Another one of her standouts came in 2008 when she adopted the visual of a circus master, commanding the gaze of the cameras and audience alike. Few other artists could keep up with Britney Spears' talent and vision through the 2000s, and many of her musical contemporaries didn't even appreciate the artistry. She became a symbol for the kind of industry pop that people were getting tired of. As evidenced by the Spears face-off against Korn's Freak on a Leash, a new population of predominantly young men was looking for something different and rougher around the edges. For some, that came in the heavy darkness of new metal, but for others, it came in the juvenile irreverence of pop punk. In 1999, Blink-182 released All the Small Things, a video paradizing Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney Spears, and Christina Aguilera. Like Freak on a Leash, All the Small Things was so popular on Total Request Live that it had to be retired. In a 2000 interview with MTV, director Marcus Siega spoke on the impact of this video. In some ways, I think that the video put Blink at that sort of pop level with those other bands, but it kind of became what it was making fun of. Pop punks got famous by presenting themselves as an alternative to the celebrity culture of the 2000s. This might be most direct in Good Charlotte's Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous, a video that took on the topic by colliding the DIY collage aesthetics of punk with imagery taken from the era of celebrity scandal. When they weren't thumbing their nose at celebrities, pop punks were running around naked or partying in skate parks in their videos. But this kind of schoolboy humor faded away as the weight of the political moment began to take hold. America fell deeper into the war on terror, and a new kind of hysteria gripped the world. So the pop punks began to embrace a darker sound and darker videos. Blink-182's I Miss You saw the band experiment with a moody, gothic aesthetic. Some 41's Pieces has Derek Wibley walking down an empty city as fake images of a hollow, perfect society drive past him. But the sharpest shift in pop punk came when Green Day released a series of videos for their seminal protest album, American Idiot. To create the visuals for this album, Green Day teamed up with Samuel Bayer, the man who had transformed MTV with Smells Like Teen Spirit more than a decade earlier. Bayer and Green Day had a cohesive vision that they maintained through five videos. Each of them used moody color palettes of beiges, greens, and grays, with sets full of decay and destruction that represented their vision of the state of America during the War on Terror. The 
These imagers were juxtaposed with symbols of empty hedonism and consumerism. Billy Joe Armstrong told Rolling Stone about his creative inspiration for these images. We were in the studio watching the journalists embedded with the troops, and it was the worst version of reality television. Switch the channel and it's Nick and Jessica. Switch and it's Fear Factor. Switch and people are having surgery to look like Brad Pitt. We were surrounded by all that bullshit, and the characters Jesus of Suburbia and St. Jimmy are as well. It's a sign of the times. The result of this strange, paradoxical existence is an alienation scene in the videos for Jesus of Suburbia or Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Bayer didn't turn to filters or digital effects to create the destroyed film on Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Instead, he manually destroyed the film negative, a process he'd first experimented with on Garbage's Stupid Girl. The most overtly political imagery from the American Idiot videos come in the Bridge of Holiday, where a ragged burlesque troupe dances in front of visions of bombs falling on cities, or in American Idiot, where the band performs in front of a grungy flag as green slime pours out of speakers. Samuel Bayer followed up American Idiot two years later by teaming up with My Chemical Romance for Welcome to the Black Parade and Famous Last Words. Like American Idiot, Welcome to the Black Parade was a statement on the morbid reality of 2000s America. My Chemical Romance leaned into German Expressionism to bring out the heightened emotion of the moment, depicting themselves as punk rock psychopomps guiding a character into a ruined underworld. Bayer and MCR were heavily influenced by Tim Burton on these videos, and even worked with Colleen Atwood, an Academy Award-winning costume designer who had collaborated with Burton in the past. This sharp aesthetic helped MCR create an instant classic, and Welcome to the Black Parade became one of the greatest touchstones for a generation of millennial teens. But that generation was becoming less and less attached to MTV. In the late 90s, MTV started to shift its programming away from music videos, filling more and more time with reality TV and original programming. People in the music industry took note of this change and started to complain. At the 2007 VMAs, Justin Timberlake even got on stage and asked MTV to play more videos. And like I said, play more damn videos. We don't, we don't want to see uh, The Simpsons on reality television. Play more videos. But it was a futile request. By 2008, MTV was only dedicating three hours a day to playing videos, a far cry from the 24-7 music video channel that it had once been. And while Timberlake's pleas did little to sway MTV, his actions at the Super Bowl years earlier were starting to have some fallout. Musicians had dabbled with online video before YouTube's unlikely birth. There were a number of other sites that experimented with streaming video, and some even played around with live streaming. Korn had a weekly live stream session on RealPlayer as they worked on Follow the Leader, but nobody had quite figured out the power of online video just yet. And then, slowly but surely, viral videos began to emerge. Flash animations like Badger 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 and the Ultimate Showdown of Ultimate Destiny spread on websites like Newgrounds alongside fan-made videos like the infamous Numa Numa Guy. And as this new language was being developed in the early 2000s, some directors were creating videos that would resonate with the online crowd. The most celebrated of these was probably Michelle Gondry, a visionary director who had an eye for the sort of eclectic ideas that would soon go viral all the time. He created celebrated videos with Kylie Minogue and the Chemical Brothers, but his most fruitful collaboration was with the White Stripes. Gondry's playful direction style gelled perfectly with the White Stripes' joyous innocence and experimental rock, and together they made some of the sharpest videos of the era. The hardest button-to-button -button and denial twist used clever editing and camera trickery to make images that stuck in the mind. The celebrated collaboration between Michelle Gondry and the White Stripes actually came about by accident. When the White Stripes were creating a video for their hit Fell in Love with a Girl, Jack White asked to work with the director of Beck's Devil's Haircut and was put in touch with Gondry. Except Gondry actually didn't direct Devil's Haircut. Devil's Haircut was directed by Mark Romanek. It was actually Beck's dead weight that Gondry had directed. But this mix-up proved serendipitous. Gondry and the White Stripes came up with the idea of making a music video entirely out of LEGO. They originally wanted to strike a deal with LEGO for the making of the video, but execs at LEGO refused, arguing that they didn't market for people over 12. So, 
That's changed. <laughs> Gondry and the band bought bins full of Lego and used them to build sets for their stop motion animation. And while much of the video is actually stop motion, big portions of it were done digitally as well, with Gondry turning video footage into pixels first and then modifying them to look like Lego bricks. These two techniques blend seamlessly in the final cut of the video. The entire process for the two minute video took two months, but the final result had a distinctly approachable DIY feel that made it a hit on the early internet. That DIY ethos was about to take over music videos. In 2006, the group OK Go released a video of themselves dancing in their backyard to their song A Million Ways. This wasn't intended as a music video, but rather as a funny bit to send between friends. In fact, their label EMI didn't even want the dance to see the light of day. According to The Guardian, the words gay and career suicide were used as the label tried to convince the band to kill it. But OK Go liked their little dance, so they slipped the footage to a fan who uploaded it onto YouTube. There, it became an unexpected viral hit and launched YouTube's first dance challenge. OK Go decided to follow this up with a proper video, albeit one made on a shoestring budget. Here It Goes Again had almost no production flair, being visibly shot on a cheap camera with a single static shot. But none of that mattered, because it had a brilliant novel choreography and an undeniable charm. The clever conceit of this treadmill dance calls back to some of the earliest days of proto-music videos, and it was exactly as difficult to shoot as you might expect. The band shot 21 different takes and only nailed the choreography in three of them. Here It Goes Again debuted on YouTube on July 31st, 2006, and it immediately went viral. It was so successful that it hit VH1's Top 20 Countdown, and later in the year, the band were invited to perform the routine at the 2006 VMAs. Here It Goes Again was a harbinger for a new era in the music video, and it introduced OK Go to millions of new fans. The band would ride the wave of this success and become known first and foremost for their elaborate and creative video ideas, like 2010's This Too Shall Pass, a video built around an entire Rube Goldberg machine. It took 60 engineers five months to set up the elaborate machine, and the actual filming took 85 takes over two days. In the wake of OK Go, a whole host of independent musicians flocked to YouTube, hoping to use it as a platform for their own hits. One of the most successful of these was Sick Puppies All the Same, which brought the free hugs movement to a global audience and helped to inspire a trend of fluffy, heartwarming videos. Meanwhile, fan-made videos were on the rise, from lip dubs, AMVs, and dance videos to more unique experiments. June 2007 saw the upload of Daft Hands, a brilliantly creative video for Daft Punk's Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger. <laughs> While this video was not made by the band itself and doesn't conform to a formal definition of the music video, there are many people to this day who associate the song more with Daft Hands than with the official video. Ever since MTV, the bounds of the music video medium had been pretty solid and clear, but the digital world was once again beginning to throw this reality into question. Viral comedy songs, flash videos, and infinite animation loops were coming out of the woodwork. Meanwhile, fan edits were providing alternative options for music videos, or creating visual representations of songs that didn't have videos. Some of these still have more views than official videos to this day. YouTube gave dozens of unlikely creators 15 seconds of viral fame and launched a new subculture. In 2008, mainstream music embraced this budding culture as Weezer released Pork and Beans. That video was the brainchild of director Matthew Cullen. He came up with the idea when directing an advertisement using stuntman Mark Hicks's viral Afro Ninja clip. Because they couldn't secure rights of the original clip for the commercial, Cullen had to bring Hicks back in and reshoot his infamous moment of failure. That process gave him an idea for a music video, and when he heard Weezer's outcast anthem Pork and Beans, he thought it would be a perfect match. He recalled in a 2008 interview with MTV Buzzworthy, I loved its non-conformist message, and felt like it's a national anthem for the self-expression that's been taking shape on YouTube and the internet. At that point, I connected the dots, and wanted to create Weezer's mashup of their favorite popular culture of the internet. A viral music video made of virals. Pork and Beans became a crossover hit, 
YouTube weirdos loved seeing their culture embraced, and mainstream fans were introduced to a whole new world of content. In these early days, YouTube was still the Wild West when it came to copyright. Fans started to upload existing music videos from established artists, giving audiences a more convenient way of watching the videos they loved, even if the labels didn't approve of it. Like the early days of MTV, these labels didn't see a clear path to make money off of uploading online, so they were slow to adopt. But in 2009, three of the four biggest record labels conspired to change this reality. Universal Music Group, Sony Music Entertainment, and EMI all put aside their differences to create Vivo, a music video streaming service designed to allow them to monetize their videos in the digital world. Talking to CNET in 2009, UMG CEO Doug Morris described their vision for Vivo as MTV on steroids. Vivo would serve as a distributor, licensing out official versions of the video to platforms like YouTube. And Vivo also worked with Google, who had a minority stake, to build out their own platform. The only problem is that their site wasn't good. It was plagued with glitches and missing the catalog of Warner Music, who instead teamed up with MTV to try to create a similar service. But their most egregious transgression was that the site was loaded with ads. In today's advertising heavy internet, this might seem like an odd breaking point, but back in the day, YouTube had very few ads and internet audiences had strong feelings about being advertised to. This focus on advertisement meant that the videos themselves needed to stay PG, so many of them were full of awkward censorship. Vivo enjoyed a brief moment in the sun, but before long it had collapsed, and YouTube took over as the internet's home of music videos. If it seems like this whole situation panned out well for YouTube in the end, that's probably because YouTube designed it that way through a series of shrewd and shady business moves. These moves allegedly even include Google botting videos to inflate view count. In 2018, an anonymous YouTube exec told Vox what their plan had been. YouTube needed Vivo to exist just long enough to become so popular that the labels had no leverage anymore. MTV's site similarly kicked the bucket around the same time. After completely transforming pop culture in the 80s and becoming a media powerhouse, MTV turned its back on the art form that built it. By the time they realized their folly, it was too late and a mighty empire had crumbled. A new age began as YouTube became the de facto home for music videos. In the YouTube age, corporate virality would become the norm, and the weirdos and outcasts that had once populated the platform would be edged out by the enormous power of the mainstream music industry. Ironically enough, the music video that might be most synonymous with the YouTube era was actually a relic of the golden age of MTV. All the way back in 1987, Rick Astley released Never Gonna Give You Up. That song was a surprise worldwide hit. As it climbed the charts, Astley's label rushed to throw together a music video. Like so many 80s videos, Never Gonna Give You Up was put together at the last minute on a pretty tight budget. In an appearance on Graham Norton, Astley explained the clothes he wore in the video were actually his own, hastily assembled from his wardrobe. And while the labels had brought in professional dancers to back Astley, they had no choreography for him, which led to him improvising a strange, jilted and awkward dance that has become so iconic today. Never Gonna Give You Up was successful enough in its day, but it would have been mostly forgotten were it not for a prank by 4chan founder Christopher Poole, aka Moot. In the early days of the image board, Moot set up a filter to change the word egg to duck in 4chan posts, which resulted in egg roll becoming duck roll. 4chan users built on this bit of surreal pranking and started a bait and switch meme where they would surreptitiously link people to a JPEG image of a duck on wheels. In 2007, some users started to evolve this so-called duck roll, changing the destination link from that JPEG to the video for Never Gonna Give You Up. This so-called Rickroll caught like a wildfire, spreading beyond the confines of 4chan and across the internet. Soon enough, people all around the world were getting linked to the Never Gonna Give You Up YouTube page. The meme became so big that many can still recognize the video by its hyperlink alone. Today, Never Gonna Give You Up has one and a half billion views on YouTube. That might sound like a lot, but in truth, Never Gonna Give You Up doesn't even crack the top 100 most viewed music videos on the platform.
As a new decade came on and the era of social media and content algorithms emerged, the music video would find itself at the center of cultural discourse once more. Some of the biggest artists in the world would kick off a trend of high concept, high budget videos. Others would begin to use the music video for stunning pieces of protest, and new artists would try to tap into the culture of virality to launch themselves into the spotlight. Beyond the mainstream, the onset of technology allowed for the sort of experiments in form that the music video hadn't seen in decades. And after a long time being relatively stable and static, the nature of music videos began to evolve. All this and more on the next episode of Hit Record. If you want to watch the next and final episode of this series, you can watch it with no ads on Nebula right now. Or, if you're the kind of person that likes a long watch, I've uploaded a full cut of this entire series to Nebula. That means you can watch the whole history of the music video from its strange and experimental beginnings all the way to its uncertain future in one sitting. And there's a ton of other great content while you're there. Personally, I'm a huge fan of Maggie Mae Fish's Nebula original, Unrated, which tells the history of sex and sexuality on film. Or you could check out Tom Nicholas's new documentary, Boomers. You can probably guess what that one's about. But maybe the real world is just a bit too intense for you right now. If that's the case, Nebula has an ever-growing host of new fiction originals like Dracula's Ex-Girlfriend or Identities. And of course, you can check out my original, Polyphonic Magazine, as well. Nebula is a prestige streaming service that I helped to build, and it's a service that I genuinely believe in. It's allowing creators to push beyond what we ever thought we could do, and funding genuine dream projects. If you want to help support these projects, or really, if you just want to watch some unreal content, you can get 40% off an annual plan by going to go.nebula.tv slash polyphonic. Following that link gets you the best deal you can get for Nebula, and it also does a ton to help support my channel. And it doesn't just need to be for you. If you think that somebody in your life might enjoy Nebula this holiday season, you can use the link gift.nebula.tv slash polyphonic to give a year of Nebula for just 36 bucks. And if you send that gift card to somebody who's already got a Nebula account, they'll get another free year added to their balance. So thank you all so much for watching, and thank you for your kind comments on this series. It's really meant a lot to see how much you've all enjoyed this, and your support means I'll probably be able to do more series like this in the future. Okay, bye!